Good evening. I invite you to join us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please. Gary? Here. Grinberg? Here. Pepcorn? Here. Strand? Here. Mahoney? Here. Hey, Tony, when you're in New Orleans, why don't you go down and see those big levees they have there? They got pretty good flood protection, I hear. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Thanks. The Fire and Water Departments in the Red River Dispatch, uh, uh, Red River Regional Dispatch, met recently with a representative from the Insurance Services Organization to update the information regarding Fargo's public protection classification, which helps determine insurance rates for residential and commercial properties. Fargo is currently ISO Class II community. ISO will review all information and give a report in four to six months. And Chief, you say if we stay at that level, we keep our fire insurance rates down for the residents? Second best rate. How would we be number one? How to get to class one? Yeah. Um, we'll see how close we get with this one, then I'll tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I thought Tony was going to say we had to put more money in the fire department. Uh, um, the Fargo Cast Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Division will partner with local law enforcement, first responders, and area uh, additional area agencies to conduct a training exercise at Fargo North High School on Friday. It will test the ability of these agencies to respond and set up a point of dispensing in the event of a public health emergency. The point of dispensing would be used to distribute medication to residents in an emergency. And this is kind of an exercise to see how well we would do with some type of uh, disbursement of a flu or a virus or something in the community. How could we combat it? Should be an interesting exercise. Uh, May is a building safety month. Each May, each week in May focuses on different topics such as partnering with code off officials to build stronger and safer communities, advancing resilient communities through the science and technology, protecting communities from disaster and safeguarding our water, improving education and training standards. Inspections are off to a good start this spring, or is that right, Bruce? Right? Police. The police department's community trust officers have received a bus from the transit department to use to transporting children to and from CTO, summer camp, and other activities. Transportation is often the biggest limitation for the involvement of the children, and this was going to be like a $40,000 van we were going to try to get, and now we had it turned over just by the transit to reuse. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, so that's a great deal. Do a lot of the kids in the summertime. And this is the thing we get a lot of calls for. I'm sure the commissioners have been uh, answering these emails. The street department has started street sweeping operations throughout the city. So if we have a lot of sand build up, they're going to get to it. Sweeping will start with arterial roads and the downtown business district. Then the crews will move into residential corridors. It usually takes about a month to sweep the entire city in the spring if the weather cooperates. But Ben, don't we have a uh, spring cleanup coming too pretty soon? Isn't that next week or? One more week. One more week, okay. I better not make the message too early. The commercial building plan review and permitting guide is now available at the city's website. The guide assists applicants with the plan review and permitting process and provides a centralized location for all materials, forms, and resources. Departments and staff involved in commercial permitting process include inspections, engineering, planning and development, fire, and Fargo Cass Public Health. This should make it easier for people trying to do commercial building plans. Well, what else do we have going on here? We have somebody who's worked with us for a while. Is that right? Ben, do you want to come up to the podium for me? Harold, do you get to come up too? Now, Harold has been with us for 30 half and a year's years of service. He's a city fleet manager. Harold Peterson is retiring on May 1st. Harold began his career, career with the city in 1979 as an equipment technician. Through hard work and dedication, he was promoted to fleet manager in 2005 and has been instrumental in the introduction of many valuable changes in the way the city manages and maintains its fleet. We hear you've helped us get our costs down in a nice way, right? Uh, ben, you've got to come and get this thing here. We want to thank and honor Harold for his many years of dedicated service to the city of Fargo and in appreciation we're going to present Harold with this plaque. Now he says he'll finally have time for his grandkids. 
He enjoys the bison, goes to the games, loves to hunt, likes old motorcycles. But here's an interesting thing about a guy. You always think about doing this in your life and you finally have the time to do it. He's going to finish his basement. <laughs> Now, Harold, when you finish your basement, we won't bring our tax assessment guys in right away. <laughs> you want to say anything to the team? Yeah, it's, it's been a privilege to work for the city of Fargo. And one thing I'm, I'll leave with is that the level of commitment of our people and our staff in the city of Fargo is second to none. And I've been very, very proud to be a part of that group and so much for riding quietly into the sunset. <laughs> you want to do cake and cookies and look what happened. It gets in front of us in the city commission. Is there a motion to approve the order of agenda and moving item one to the consent agenda to the, or from consent agenda to the regular agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the April 9th, 2018 regular meeting? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Any changes, discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items 1 through 31, excluding item 1, which has been moved to the regular agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Gehrig? Yes. Hepcorn? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. We'll move to the regular agenda. Uh, Chief Dirksen is going to explain the seven, 2017 Fargo Fire Department statistical information. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, it's uh, that time of year again where I get to talk about all the things that happened uh, with the Fire Department last year and give you some uh, of our statistics that we've compiled throughout the year. Um, as you can see, uh, it was a busy year again, the busiest year that we've ever had. Uh, we're just, just shy of 11,000 uh, total emergent responses last year. Uh, we continue to trek up on this uh, as our city continues to grow, as we add more people, people make more phone calls to 911 and uh, we get busier. I know the police department, the ambulance service, they all uh, are recognizing this as well. Um, but we keep going at it. We're, we've done things throughout uh, this year to kind of look at the responses that we're doing and how many trucks we're sending and we're, we're taking a look at that and, and seeing how that affects how we go forward uh, in, in the next couple of years. So looking at these responses, we're looking at ways that we can reduce them and it's uh, one of those things is, uh, you know, people uh, need to take uh, good care of themselves, uh, their homes, uh, their, their physical uh, nature, get out and exercise more so that we don't have to come for medical calls, uh, those type of things. Uh, watch what, how you respond, uh, how you cook, how you get rid of your uh, smoking materials, those kind of things. Those tend to be our, our largest calls and reasons for fires. As you can see on the next slide, oh, back one. There we go. Calls by planning zone or downtown area continues to be the busiest area in town with uh, just over almost 3,300 responses. Uh, again, a majority of those are medical, but a lot of those are also uh, investigations, dumpster fires and those types of things, grass fires and that, that nature in the downtown area. Another area where we're starting to see uh, even more growth, and this has been tracking up a little bit over the last few years, is in the Station 5 area, the West, a West Acres area. Um, we're noticing more calls for service out in that area. Um, as well as well as the station two, which is on uh, 25th Street and 32nd Avenue South, in that uh, that southwestern part or southeastern part of town. You can see on the next one uh, we have our heat map there, and that kind of shows a little bit more of those responses, and that tracks with the data um, where we're at there. So that that heat map, right? Uh, you can see the downtown area is is definitely a higher response area, and then it kind of tracks down to that 32nd Avenue South and over towards the West Fargo um, border there. Uh, here's just a map of the responses by uh, all of the planning zones. We have the city divided into nine planning zones. Don't worry, I didn't build two more fire stations that we didn't tell you about. Um, when you look at planning zone nine and planning zone eight, um, but those are areas that we're starting to track for statistical purposes um, that will help make determinations of when we need to uh, 
uh, look at fire stations and we are right at that point at, um, at this point where we need to have something in that southwest or that southeast part um, in the Davies neighborhood uh, for responses because we're seeing elongated response times down there. Uh, folks that live in those areas are seeing uh, response times for anywhere from a minute and a half to two and a half minutes longer depending on where the truck is coming from if it's coming from station seven or station two. Uh, the calls by type, we are still uh, heavy on the, on the medical side uh, with 6,400 responses. We, you know, we have a tiered response system. We respond along with the FM ambulance um, who does all the, or the medical transport in the community. Uh, Fargo PD responds quite often with us as well. Um, but this seems to be uh, the area that we uh, continue to um, uh, see growth in year after year on the medical side. Uh, some of it I will call is due to people uh, driving by and seeing something and making a call and not actually stopping and seeing what's going on. Uh, we get a lot of um, our man down calls fall into this. So um, we last year one of the issues that we had was uh, up at uh, the Lutheran Church just up the street here on Broadway. They had uh, homeless Jesus there. I can't tell you how many times we got called for someone um, on, the, on the bench there in front of the church. Um, so one of the things I'd ask the public is, is if, you, if it's safe for you to do so, stop and check on folks before you call 911. Don't just call 911. Um, make sure it's a judicious response of why we're, why we're needed to go to those, those types of things. But uh, one nice thing is, is our false calls is down from, uh, down to about 1,400 calls. When I first arrived here in Fargo in about 2012, we were going somewhere on the 17 to 1800 response, responses for false alarms and false calls. Uh, we've worked with some of our problem uh, places uh, that had uh, cooking issues, so we, we've done some education there. We have also worked with some of, uh, some of the building owners and, and where they actually placed uh, smoke detectors in the buildings. Uh, some of them, go ahead, Dave. Can I ask a couple questions, Mr. Chair? Is that okay? Yes, go ahead. So one of the so do you charge if you, you get so many calls? Is that right? And then if you if if someone is a uh, abusive uh, false caller, do they get charged for that? Um, we don't have that in ordinance. Um, I, the police department has that that in ordinance. We don't um, we don't have a ton of those. Okay. We've we've worked through a lot of those issues, and that's why we've seen the the reduction. But but I would say I, if you want somebody to help you write that, I, I would propose that because that was unfortunately my business has false calls and we got charged. I was like, what the heck is this? But but I do think it's a legitimate thing, and and I'm I'm sure you still have someone that 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 do that. So I think that would be a good thing to do. And then I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so the 911 when they dispatch, do they automatically send you out, or how do, can you tell how that goes? Sure. Um, well. They have a, a very uh, lengthy process, well not lengthy process, but a very uh, well-tuned process. On the medical calls, it's called emergency priority dispatch. And they have a series of questions that they ask and they, they try to get as much information as possible. One of the, one of the things that we run into um, on the medical side is our, our Norwegian uh, heritage up here is, well, I don't know that it's really too bad and I don't know if somebody, I really need to go to the hospital. I don't know if I should, you know, and it takes a little while to get that information out. When we have people that are having a heart attack or difficulty breathing, we, our data shows those calls are processed very quickly, but we get in those middle, middle well, I don't really know if I should go see somebody or not. Um, it, it can take two and a half to three minutes to process that call. Um, fire calls are, are usually you know, something that happens pretty quickly. Uh, we just had one on, on my way in here. We had a, a, a lawnmower uh, fire next to a, a garage, and it went really quick, and our, our folks were in just like that, so. Thank you. Mr. Garrick. Specifically to your point, which is why I bring it up now, you know, you had your focus group or survey or whatever you want to call it a couple weeks back and you're working with a consultant and, and to him, the biggest question I had to him was how do we get these numbers down as far as responses per year because they're going up so fast and that, that is a difficulty right there but I think we need to find best practices from other places and see how we can find a better way to dispatch less people, not saying we're not going to go. Yeah. But if you stub your toe, we shouldn't be there. Right, you know. and that's, that's always a struggle, and that's when I talk with uh, colleagues from around the country, that seems to be, everybody's seeing an increase in call volume. Nobody's, nobody's going down. I, I've yet to talk to a fire chief where their responses are declining. Um, it just it seems to grow, and we're, we're always looking at those ways and how we can do it better. We want to be effective, and then we'll be efficient uh, along with that, but we want to be effective first. Uh, the next one here, the most common types of fires. The good thing is, is our numbers of fires in our community are really staying pretty steady throughout the years. We haven't seen a sharp increase uh, in the number of fires. Uh, this last year, we had 81 building fires. 
and that coincides to the year before when we had 82. Um, but if you even go back into our records into the 80s, uh, those numbers are you know just climbing ever so slightly, and you can you know we know what the population has done in the last 30 years in this community, and the the number of structures that are are have been put up. Um, we you know we're, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we're there, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we're at an ISO class two. And I think one of the the next slides here you're gonna you're gonna like the numbers that you see as well. So this was our total fire loss uh, last year. We were just over two million dollars in fire loss, and that means the contents of the house or the building plus the building. So we had, in a city of our size with just about $15 billion in assessed property values, uh, we had $2 million, a little bit more uh, loss in the community. When you look at it, on the next slide, when we look at the, the pre-incident value, so after the fire, we go back and look at the assessor's data on the structure, and then we make a best guess estimate um, on what the value was in that structure for personal goods and things like that. Um, using some data that's provided to us through the National Fire Protection Agency and, and other instance, other agencies uh, to kind of get that guess. And if we can get the numbers from the insurance company, we try to adjust that data to that as well. Um, sometimes we don't, you know, we're making our best guess on the loss, but you know, we may guess that it's $100,000 and the insurance company comes back and says, well, they paid out $150,000 in the loss. And if we can get that data and keep contacting, we, we do update the records. But this is the, the best that we can, can get out of this. So, you know, when you look at $150 million um, in property and, and, uh, and other things that, and contents that could have been involved in fire and only have a $2 million loss, that's a, I, I'll put those numbers up against anybody. Um, and the good thing is in our community, we haven't any, had any fire related deaths, I believe since 2013. So that's a, another really good thing for our community. So we are a very safe community on a fire um, uh, aspect. Um, Kind of to go on the Commissioner Pepcorn's uh, information or question here is we we look at our call time. So from some, the minute somebody dials 911 to when we arrive on scene, so at 90 per, 90 percent of the time we're on scene um, of an emergency within eight minutes and 11 seconds, and our goal is eight minutes and 12 seconds. And uh, usually two and a half to three minutes is the processing time from when someone dials 911 to when the dispatcher actually dispatches us. So we lose that two and a half to three minutes that we don't have any control over. Then it takes us anywhere from 60 seconds to 90 seconds, depending on the emergency, to get out of the building, out of the fire station and, and out the door, and then you know four minute travel time. So we're doing very well there. The one thing we're trying to do is how do we, how do we uh, shorten that call processing time at the dispatch center? And we've been working hard with uh, the dispatch center since 2015. We've seen incremental decreases in there, but we just haven't seen enough to where we want to be yet. Uh, some of the major accomplishments that we've, that we've uh, completed this last year, uh, again, uh, this year, similar to the year before, is we worked with NDSU, uh, a doctoral student, on her thesis um, to uh, study CPR and its effect on and the cardiovascular training on firefighters and to see what that, how that does, how that works. And uh, what we found is, is we've got some pretty healthy guys um, and, and uh, they're fairly effective in what they do, so um, that's good. Uh, one of the other big highlights that we had from last year is we started the drone program. We were able to purchase that on a grant from DES last year, along with a rescue boat. boat. Uh, the drone program, it's not moving as quick as we would like it to. Um, we have assembled a group between ourselves, the Fargo Police Department, the Cass County Sheriff's Office, West Fargo PD, and West Fargo Fire. Um, we're just kind of stuck at the FAA right now, trying to get our waivers so that we can fly um, in, in the city of Fargo. This uh, flying close to an airport that sits kind of in our town causes some issues for us. So we're working on that. Um, they have regulations of where we can fly and how fly high we can fly, but they haven't given us the waiver yet. So we're working through that. That's sitting in Washington. We'll see what Mr. happens. Chairman, can I ask one question about that? So does the drone have infrared, or how would that help you in fighting a fire? We have actually two different cameras. We have a, just a regular camera, and then we do also have a FLIR infrared camera. So um, we're, lo we're looking at our policies on how we can deploy that and use it actually on fires. Um, uh, we were, uh, we, it was used earlier um, in the county uh, last year for a, a search for some individuals that were out in the county, so it uh, worked out. Do all the firemen have infrared uh, equipped helmets? Uh, no. Um, we're actually going away from some of those and going to handheld uh, infrared uh, thermal imaging cameras. The, 
there, there's a, a school of debate whether that works, um, but a lot of which one is better, and we, most of our guys are now preferring the handheld. Um, but we do have those on every truck. Um, not every firefighter has them. They run about uh, $7,000 or so. So they're not, uh, not cheap, but they're way cheaper than when they first came out in the 90s when we paid $22,000 for them. So um, they've come down quite a ways. We've had a few promotions uh, over the last year, a new assistant chief and a battalion chief, uh, some captains. Um, we had a, a quality improvement through, edu uh, through accreditation class that we put a lot of our folks through. Uh, we've purchased some, uh, through a cooperation with the police department, some uh, ballistic uh, protective equipment for active shooters uh, situations. So uh, we have some of the, uh, the same equipment as the police uh, department has, uh, so our folks can be more proactive um, if we do ever have an active shooter um, incident in our community, which we hope we don't. Um, we did exercise that program and our, our policies this last year at Sanford just before they opened the new hospital. Uh, we learned a lot of things about our policy and how we need to interact with each other and we're still working through some of those things as well. Uh, we had three retirements uh, last year that equated to uh, just, just shy of uh, 90 years of service to our community. So um, that's happening. And then uh, our firefighters uh, local um, with the IAFF, uh, they're very active in the community. They've led, uh, they participated in the MDA Fill the Boot where they raised uh, $24,000, something like that. Uh, they do the Fire Up the Kettles campaign, they raised t over $20,000 there. Uh, they go and deliver gifts to the kids in the hospital at Christmas. Uh, they're flipping burgers um, out on the plaza for gift burgers and some of them even go to the fashion show that Dan puts on for that as well. So um, they're, they're busy uh, giving their time off duty um, to raise money and support events in, in the community as well. Um, and that's all I have for you. Any question by the Commissioner? Commissioner Pepcorn. Got two more. So the Red Cross smoke detector thing, has that gone on or is it coming up? That is going to be this Saturday. Um, we've had great um, response from the community. We've got some great partners um, in the community that have stepped up with a lot of volunteers. I think we were looking for 120 and we got 160 plus volunteers um, that are going to be helping out. One more. And then cleanup week. Uh, so I don't want to admit, but I have a lot of old paint cans and so the whole reducing your fire danger by getting rid of some of your old stuff in your garage. I don't want to point any fingers at myself, but. <laughs> Bring it to household hazardous waste. Don't put it on the curb. <laughs> and, and, but the, the, the electronics, uh, that, that is fantastic. Yep. And their hours, they're open almost every day. So it's, I would highly recommend it. That's, that's a great service uh, that we have. So thank you. Commissioner Garrick. Well, thanks for the update, Chief. Uh, I think if people take nothing else away, it's that you're an effective force and you're cost effective as well. Uh, so we definitely get a bang for our dollars here. And for the commissioners, you know, especially those of us who live down south, you know, I'm, I'm right in, in zone two. And if you're in zone eight by Davies, you're miles and miles away from a, from a station. So that's definitely something we need to keep an eye on as far as how we're going to fund that going into the future. But fire stations aren't that expensive, are they, Tony? A couple bucks. A couple those million, are, those think, are, right? That's the cheap part. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Chief Dirksen, I'm just curious, how, do, how does it get determined whether an ambulance or an, a fire truck responds? Um, an ambulance or, or response. Or is it both? Or? Yeah, we do a, a joint response. Um, there aren't, uh, the way we do it, there's 33 chief complaint codes that uh, the dispatch center works, there's, works through um, when they're dispatching. We respond on 27 of those. Um, there's, there's six of them that, that really are, are very much lesser codes that once you weed them out, it's, somebody, it's not an emergent situation, and uh, so we don't send a fire truck to that. But anything where, where it's emergent, we respond. Um, one, of the, one of the other things that we do in the wintertime, once we start hitting that cold weather, and if there's anybody that's uh, for a medical call that's outside, regardless of the EMD code, the fire department responds just because uh, trying to provide warmth as, as much as we can. And this year we, we, we started it early and we kept it going. I think we're going to take it off at the end of the week. So um, we, we've extended that as well. So yeah, we both go for just about everything. And if I might, one more question, Mayor. Um, how's it going with Narcan? You know, I'm, 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 I forgot to add that in the report, and I'm, I knew you were going to ask it when I stood up here. Um, we, the one thing I'm proud to report, or I'm glad to report, I guess, is that we've had a reduction in our Narcan administration in, in our community over the last year. Uh, when we first started it um, in 2016, uh, it seemed like we were giving it quite a bit. Um, but last year, the re for doing it a full year, I think was um, significant. I know it was significantly less than what we did in half a year's time in 2016. Thank you. 
Richard Grinberg, anything on your side? Nope. Thank you. Okay. Move to second item 33, uh, update on 19th Avenue North. Commissioner Dave Pepcorn put this on with some concerns about passability and snow in the wintertime. You had some yeah, concerns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Scott, if you would come up and just talk a little bit. So my main concern is, and Eric knows the exact date, that in, in 84 we had some fatalities on 19th Avenue uh, from snow drifting. And so I, the city has been meeting with the airport authority trying to find some solutions as to uh, live plant material that could hopefully snow, uh, and then, keep that uh, from blowing John in. And John Oberstein is here as well to address awesome. the airport. So, but go well. ahead, Scott, Just if you don't mind just talking a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, shortly after the, it was called upon at the, at the commission meeting, we did meet uh, with uh, reps from the airport, their consultants, the FAA, Fargo Public Works, and the North Dakota Department of Transportation. There were options and ideas discussed. Uh, landscaping, additional landscaping inside the fence, additional landscaping outside the fence, uh, even some uh, land sculpting, uh, some subtle changes that could be applied just to catch some of the snow or, or slow it down uh, inside the fence. Uh, ultimately, uh, with the challenges and the restrictions and the requirements of the FAA, on top of that space between the fence and the roadway already being very, very narrow, and how that relates to, to snow fence dynamics and the location of 19th Avenue and the elevation of it. Uh, as for, from a vegetation standpoint, we really didn't come up with any options as far as that. So Mr. Chairman, that's what concerns me is uh, this is a life safety issue. And so we have to have some solutions. We can't just uh, leave it the way it is now. That's, it's not safe. And so the other thing that concerns me is the liability uh, if that happens again, where some loss of life happens, uh, we're going to get sued. And so to me, we have to start looking at some solutions instead of, right now we have nothing. And so it's, that's been too long that this has been going on. Sean, you want to address this as well, please? Well, commissioners, I don't have a lot more to add. I think Scott did a really, very good job summarizing the discussion that we had. And if you go back in the documents that I had provided, and I think, Mayor, you were provided a copy of everything that we had in our file from 1984 through 87, the same, everything that was accomplished at that time as far as recommendations is still in place today. Uh, the navigational aids that are still in place at the airport, the localizer, the glide slope, the Malzers, all of the approach lighting systems, that is the same infrastructure that was in place the last time that this was looked upon. Uh, the localizer is the array of equipment just inside the fence on 19th Avenue and just side, inside the fence on Cass County 20, which centers the aircraft onto the runway. That's what the localizer does. It's got a 35 degree angle on it to make sure that the aircraft comes down to the center of the runway. It works in conjunction with the glide slope, which is the rate of descent, the angle of descent that the aircraft has as it works with the localizer. Those are two pieces of equipment that work in conjunction with, with each other. And the same restrictions that the FAA had back in the earlier discussions in the 80s are in place today. So anything, any time that vegetation or anything is greater than 12 inches in height, it has to be addressed, whether it's snow, grass, uh, branches, leaves, or whatever it might be. That puts that equipment out of service, which then is a life safety hazard to those that are on aircraft arriving or departing from the airport. So um, the file is very extensive. Um, like I say, uh, if you look through the history of it, uh, there was a lot of criticism back when 19th Avenue was designed and subsequently after the incident in 84 in terms of the elevation of the road. I believe some of the records are between the FAA and the city and there was others in the room, Kevin Gorder at the DOT, I believe 19th was lowered like 3.47 feet or something of that nature. So it's really what's called a ditch and that's a lot of the north side residents back at that time referred to it as a ditch. That's in the information that, that was in the packet. Uh, whether or not that elevation can be raised in the future, uh, there's discussion about reconstructing 19th Avenue from 18th Street to I-29, 2020, 2021. I'm not sure. I guess engineering can answer the exact time frame that they're looking at. Uh, if the avenue can be raised, uh, they'd have to work in conjunction with the FA to make sure that the nav aids that are in place today are not impacted and the nav aids that they look at putting in place in the future because these nav aids will have at the end of their useful life new navigational aids have to be put in place. But if that road system can be elevated, 
a foot, two feet, three feet, whatever that may be, that is all to be determined. And the FA has committed to working with the state and the city as they look at those possible designs. That would help, you know, hopefully allow a lot of the snow to blow across. Because if you look at the south side with the documentation here, I think Assistant City Engineer Bob Welton had reported back to the commission, the south slope of 19th Avenue along the back curb where NDSU owns that property, a lot of that soil was removed to try and get the, the snow to blow across. Uh, the visibility I don't believe is any different on 19th Avenue than it would be on 7th Avenue North, 12th Avenue North, we go to 32nd and 40th and 52nd Avenue South during a winter event. The difference is is that the elevation of 19th catches snow. But um, I think the only other updates that I've been party to at the airport since this group here had put this together in 84 to 87 is a lot of discussions with the police department or fire department and others and went to close 19th Avenue North. And that's a decision that's made by the city or the police department, not the airport authority. Um, and when they decided to step up the closure process, if you will, or criteria to close 19th Avenue North during inclement weather, a number of years ago, an alternate route was set up to the airport, which is 8th Avenue North off of North University Drive, which turns into Dakota Drive. In all the years I've been at the airport, I've never not once not been able to make it to the airport on Dakota Drive. It works well. Um, but the incidence of closing 19th Avenue North, while all be terrible and so forth, we have a bigger inconvenience from, say, closing I-29 during a snow event, or even more inconvenience when we have heavy summer rainfalls and the underpasses are flooded or there's you know, street flooding in some of the neighborhoods. That's probably more of an inconvenience than possibly closing 19th, which is, what, maybe twice now in the last three, four years, I guess, been at Public Works could give you the exact data on that. Sure. So. Well, I, I guess the main thing is there's people that have died there. And, and so for us to say, uh, we can't do anything, that's not a, an acceptable uh, answer from my perspective. So I, I think we have to do something. And, and to say that there are no solutions, that's, that's, not, a good, that's not a good one. And I do, I do think we have a liability issue from the city, because this year, and Ben does a great job of closing it off, uh, this year there was people out there where there was no visibility and there were people driving on it, and, and we were very fortunate no one got injured because uh, it could have happened. Yeah. And, I, and I know it's the winter is unpredictable, and, mm -hmm. but I think from our perspective, uh, 19th Avenue, that's, that's our responsibility, and, and uh, we, get, we need to do something. So. Yeah, if you have any ideas, I know the FAA is ready to, ready to hear those, but like I say, the But we just had a meeting, and, and the meeting was basically, yeah, you can't do anything. Yeah, that's because the restrictions that are in place on the nav aids really hasn't changed. That, that's the same navigational equipment that's been in place for a long time. Well, then, you, then they might of, want to change the navigational equipment or change the runway or do something, because uh, 19th Avenue is a heavily traveled artery for the right. city of Fargo. Right. Yep. Mr. Garrett, that leads into mine. So I think there are a lot of people watching that apply to say, you know, why not just move the nav aids? You know, is there a cost associated with that? Is there, you know, are they ineffective in a different spot? I mean, explain to people who might not know what, why you can't just move these nav aids wherever you want. Yeah, I mean, they're fixed based on the relationship to the ends of the runway. Um, the, the coordinates and the distances are all set to, per their functionality. Um, uh, there's no other location for them to go that, that I'm aware of, and that was discussed. M Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm just telling you, if somebody dies, it's going to cost somebody a whole lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and to say we have equipment there that we can't move, uh, that, that's not going to be an acceptable answer. So that's, that's what I'm concerned about. Just common sense. Uh, Sean, would you be able, if, if you followed David's logic, would you be able to move the runway further north, thereby moving the nav aid further north and extending the runway further north, or what causes you not be able to that do that? That was done during our last reconstruction project. We lost 500 feet of runway. The runway threshold was moved further north. So we're at 9,000 feet now. We were at 95, 46 before, based on the functionality of the airport and so forth. But um, So you don't yeah. really have the option of moving that nav aid, is what you're saying? I don't know that they can be moved. That's a question for FA Tech Ops. Uh, Chris Menz would have been here, but he's, he's traveling today. Um, I mean, that's an answer we can bring back to you, but I don't know. But, but the other question is, who, who runs the show? I, I mean, 19th Avenue, do they, does the FAA tell us what to do uh, for public safety for the city of Fargo? That's, that's, the, that's the question I have. Because the other thing is, if the FAA says you can't do anything, then to me, they're responsible if somebody gets injured. Because we're going to do every, everything we can 
But if they're telling us we can't, then it's on them, or at least that's, and I know Eric has already looked at this, and you know, when something bad happens, everybody gets sued, but I just wanna make sure that it's not us. Because we're trying to do everything, and the FAA says, yeah, you can't do anything. That's, that's, uh, that's no way to run a railroad or an airport. Any other discussion? Thank you. We'll go to public hearings, uh, item 34, amendment to the 2017 action plan for housing and community development to reflect the change in the number of home assisted units in, in the home field phase two community housing development organization project located at 4235 28th Avenue South. Nicole Cotchfield to explain. And if you want, um, Mayor and Commissioners, if you want to take 34A and B together, um, they're kind of the same. That'd be fine. Same item. Uh, so uh, basically this is more or less technical paperwork for uh, um, housing and urban development and our federal um, home assisted funds. And um, this is going to um, the home fields phase two project and um, future phases. And all we're doing is taking one of the subsidized units and moving it from one year to another year. This basically helps us with our paperwork and tracking for the federal um, uh, requirements. So be, because it's a $50,000 change in scope of work, it's required to go to a public hearing. And so that's why we're in front of you tonight. Um, so staff recommend support. The Community Development Committee uh, recommended uh, support unanimously last week. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this change? Is there anyone present who wishes to speak? If not, we'll close public hearing. Do I have a motion? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. This is item A and B together, 34. Strand? Yes. Gary? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Item C, plot of Urban Plains by Brandt, third edition, replot of lot one, block four, Urban Plains by Brandt, first edition, and lot one, block three, Urban Plains by Brandt, second edition. Uh, 2633 and 286755 Street South. Approval recommended by Planning Commission on 10317. Planner Don Gress to explain. Cress to explain. Good evening, Commissioners. Donald Cress from the Department of Planning and Development. I'll be presenting the next two items. As the mayor has stated, first item here is the plat of uh, Urban Plains by Brandt, third edition. We locate this here on Veterans Boulevard. 30th Avenue South, 26th Avenue South, this large area here. Property is currently zoned LC Limited Commercial. The zoning will not change. We're just platting this property. Uh, this shows the plat, which will create six lots and two blocks, attending to, uh, intending to allow for the first phase of the development of a lifestyle center. The applicant has planned for this area. Commissioners, this is a sideways graphic here, north to your left, as you'll note. Uh, but this has uh, both public right away here and uh, a private drive here uh, that uh, dedicated right away there is 28th Avenue South and the private drive is proposed to be called Uptown Way. I believe uh, that's changed from the original graphic that it says Main Street because we already have a Main Street. So that'll be Uptown Way. Uh, the, uh, there are two entitlements that went along with this that, that ended at the Planning Commission. Your commission does not see conditional use permits, but uh, the Planning Commission approved two conditional use permits for Block 5, Lot, or lot 5, Block 1. Uh, one was for household living within the LC Limited Commercial Zone, and the other was an alternative access plan to reduce off-street parking requirements. The purpose of these two conditional use permits is to allow for the development of the mixed-use lifestyle center. Uh, the applicant, Brian Pattengale, is with us this evening and may wish to address the commission. The Planning Commission's recommendation is stated in your staff report and shown on the screen. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Commissioners. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this change? Oh, okay. Is there anyone else but who would like to address this? If not, we'll close public hearings. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Is there a move second? for approval. I'll second it. Grinberg moves it. Pepcorn seconds it. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Grinberg. Aye. Pepcorn. Aye. Strand. Yes. Gehrig. Yes. Mahoney. Aye. Item E. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Item D. D. Uh, Timber Creek 8th edition, uh, 5050 Timber 
Parkway South and 5131 Prosperity Way South, approval recommended by the Planning Commission on 1418, a zoning change to repeal and reestablish conditional overlay on lots one and two, block one, at first reading of the rezoning ordinance and a plat of the Timber Creek 8th edition. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, we'll locate this here, Timber Creek Parkway South, 52nd Avenue, I-29 is over here. Uh, this is a portion of that property there, a plat and zone change for Timber Creek 8th edition. The property is zone GC, general commercial, and the zoning itself will not change. However, there's a conditional overlay on this that the applicant is requesting to modify some features of, and so thus we, uh, this is, counts as a zone change. We review it as a zone change. Uh, the proposed modifications are to standards for building massing, screening, and operational requirements. As stated here, that's also right in an uh, excerpt from your staff report here. The zoning changes included in your package is an ordinance prepared by the city attorney's office. Uh, staff has reviewed these with the applicant. Um, the plat itself will not change any existing lot lines within the subdivision. However, there's a 24-foot access easement that exists over the shared lot line. The replat will vacate this access easement and provide a, a relocated access easement to the south side of lot one. The applicant, Nate Volmuth, is with us this evening and may wish to address the commission. The Planning Commission's recommendations is stated in your staff report and shown on the screen. The recommendation is for approval of both these uh, modifications to this conditional overlay and the plat. That concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Donald, what are they going to do there? Are they going to change something physically in the curbing, or what are they doing? They're relocating the, um, the access easement. Mr. Volmuth, what, do you have, uh, I'll have the applicant explain that to you, sir. Right there. They're going to put access right there. This, there's only a building here. Building yeah. down there. Thank you, Mayor and co Commissioners. Um, there is a Dairy Queen being constructed on that site right now. Um, essentially, we just moved the access uh, up into the to be all within lot one, uh, which is uh, an existing retail center. Um, there was an access there before, but it was meant for the Essentially, the, the plan of the dairy queen would have been mirrored, so the parking would have been on the north side, and they changed it to have it on the south side, so the front door is facing south. So that's why the changes were made. So kind of wondering what you're fitting in that corner. It looked like a tight little spot, but there's crazy dairy queen. Tony can take his kid down there all Anything the time. Anything for dairy queen. That's all right. Approved. <laughs> Is anyone president who wishes to speak in regards to this replatting? Is anybody who wishes to speak? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Uh, Grinberg uh, first, Gehrig second. Any further discussion? Denny Wallacher would be happy. He loves Dairy Queens. Roll call vote, please. <laughs> Grinberg? Aye. Gehrig? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Item E, application filed by JDB. LLC doing business as Kilstone Brewing for a Class C alcoholic beverage license at 2020 or 222 Broadway North. Steve Sprague to explain. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, just one clarification before we get going too far here. Um, the agenda says a Class C. Uh, they're actually applying for a, a C, which is beer, uh, M, which is a, a wine license, and a W, or excuse me, um, yeah, C, W, and M. So it's beer, wine, and then the M allows them to do growlers and, and that type of thing. So um, just wanted to clarify on that. I'm not exactly sure why it didn't get on the agenda. It must have been a clerical error somewhere. Um, this has come before liquor control. Uh, there are no issues other than uh, the chief reiterated his saturation concerns in the downtown area, which we'll um, continue to study, I guess, as the, at the liquor control area. If there's any questions. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak to this license? Is there anyone present who wishes to speak? Hearing none, uh, close public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Uh, Pepcorn and Garrick. Uh, discussion, Commissioner Garrick. I just want to update on, the, we, we don't cap at the wine license, correct? The W? Yeah, we set that at, um, was it 10 or 15? I, I don't remember exactly. You know how many there are out there right now? There's not many, right? Um, Three or four. Yeah, it's not a like lot. That. And then we raised the C license up to 10 as well. We, we made them the same, yes. Okay, and there's still a few of those left as well. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? 
And I will comment too, the, um, the applicant, especially after the discussion uh, that we had with Cowboy Jacks, um, kind of revised their plan a little bit and are adding more food to options and, and are uh, planning on making it a family-friendly event or a family-friendly uh, establishment. Very good. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Gehrig? Yes. Strand? Yes. Grinberg? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Item F, a continuance to 52118 transfer of FA license, beverage license from Anderson Franchise Investment doing business at Pearls or Perla uh, Fresh Mexican to North Star Hospitality doing business as 47 degrees north on 42nd, 81, 45th Avenue South. There'll be a continuance on that. Do I have a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Strand? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Gary? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Item G, transfer of class GH alcoholic beverage license from Lila uh, Thai Cuisine to Lila Thai Cuisine at Maya Thai to Lila Thai Cuisine. <laughs> You're killing me. That's <laughs> 1450 25th Street South. This is a beer and wine license. Uh, it's an ownership change, and so the business isn't moving or anything like that. We just have to move the liquor license since licenses are issued to person and a place. What's GH? GH is beer and wine um, table service. So what's the difference between your CWM and this? Do table service? Um, no, the difference is food requirement. The GH is for a restaurant. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So anyone wishes to speak to this application? Anybody wishes to speak? Hearing none, close public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Uh, Pepcorn and Garrick. Uh, roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Gehrig? Yes. Strand? Yes. Grinberg? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. So we'll go back to item one. Uh, Commissioner Grinberg pulled this one. It's a reading the first ordinance amending article 2515 of chapter 25 of the Fargo Municipal Code relating to alcoholic beverages. And I think I'll have Steve just explain it, Tony, just so the public knows what we're talking about, and then we'll have a discussion. Sure, just a little bit of history on this. Um, this is part of our liquor license renewal process. Uh, as part of that process, about 10 years ago, we established uh, the requirement that licensees attend an annual meeting. Um, and, and we have uh, three meetings in one day. Uh, the, you know, the licensee or a manager or another support staff person could attend. Um, what we've found is in the last few years, uh, we have repeat people that, that fail to attend, and there really are no consequences for not attending. And so um, the chief, uh, Assistant City Attorney Nancy Morris, um, Farcast Public Health, uh, and I, we met and discussed this and uh, brought forward a, an ordinance change that would require, um, if, they don't, if they fail to attend the meeting, there would be a monetary penalty applied to this. Um, and then they still would have to attend the meeting, and if they fail to attend, the second, their, like their um, makeup session, they would still have to, there would be an additional monetary fine, and then they would still have to do um, an educational session that we would have on a, like a web link, so they'd be able to do that uh, kind of on their own. And, and if, until they get all of those steps taken care of, basically attend that, that meeting, uh, we wouldn't renew their liquor license. So it could come down to you know, June 30th, and they'd still have to do that. So. I don't know if there's more questions beyond that, or Mr. Grinberg. Well, I appreciate um, Steve's uh, Steve's overview. I, I received a couple emails this afternoon, and that's why I asked to pull it. Um, the citizens were complimentary of the proactiveness, um, largely based on the Cowboy Jacks debate of you know tightening up a little bit. And Commissioner Pepcorn's, you know, um, support we talked about when we passed Cowboy Jacks that we wanted to you know change the way we do business to be a little more strict. Um, were appropriate, and I just felt that we should have at least uh, acknowledgement of this um, rather than just going on consent and nobody knowing about it. So uh, public's watching, and I thought that, you know, we should just have a brief overview of, um, you know, we're making progress, and um, um, thanks for pulling it off, and thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Mr. Pepcorn, can you kind of explain to the public, too, uh, Chief Todd brought some other or some other thoughts about doing some enforcement that you guys are looking at to right now that might help with public drunkenness? Right. The the chief has a proposed ordinance and it'll go to liquor control then to us but basically uh, right now for public intoxication they get hauled to jail and so he's working on a concept where you basically can get a ticket 
And so that would just, it would be a lot easier process. That's kind of the rough concept. And anybody that wants to come and join the conversation, you're welcome to do it. And I will add one more thing. So we're working on the Cowboy Jacks area. To me, this is an opportunity to, to improve that block. And so uh, we're going to meet with the chief. And uh, Jim Swanick is a friend of mine. He's the owner of the Bismarck and the Empire and also Steve's Package. And if you've been by there, we've had a few comments about the exterior decorating at, at Steve's Package. Not, it's not the most. So, but there's other things in that neighborhood. To give an example, S Sanford has a strip mall and there's no lighting in the parking <coughs> lot. So there's, there's lots of things and some cameras. And, and so there's things we can do to improve that neighborhood uh, to make it. And, and, and I believe Cowboy Jacks will have more uh, customer traffic and, and that those things will improve safety. So that's what we're, we're working on. I think this is an opportunity to do that. So and that's, that's what we're working on. Go if ahead. I can, I hate to jump in, but there's a, a, an additional ordinance that the chief brought to liquor control last time um, in our ordinance on over serving. Uh, there is a, there's a part in there that it has to be corroborated by a third party. Um, and so we're going to remove that language and then it'll make it easier for um, for the police department to, to do their work. So you'll be seeing that uh, ordinance change in the near future. Very good. Let's not place those on a consent, okay? No. Okay, Nancy. We'll explain it. I think Chief will explain it when he comes in to talk about that particular ordinance. And then Dave, are we gonna look at lighting issues as well? Where would we take that? Would that be with street department or would that be, who, who would who be doing our lights? Some of these are private property issues, and but I think, I mean, like Sanford, we'll talk to them. They're they're, they're very, uh, they're in favor of safety down there for all their employees too. So some of these things will just take time. There's a couple in the alley where maybe Ben can uh, do some some uh, alley street lighting or something. Anyway, we're, we're that's a work in progress. But if you drive down there, the lighting is actually pretty good. But there's there's other things uh, like cameras and things that we can work on. So we're we're in the process. And if anybody has any suggestions, uh, Tony and I are on liquor control. We would love to have you join the conversation. And and uh, it's an opportunity, I think, to upgrade that area. Very good. So we have a uh, motion for that, please. We don't have one yet, do we, Shelley? Do I have a motion for item one, please? I move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Gary? Yes. Strand? Yes. Grinberg? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Just so the public knows, we crested uh, this morning, Ben, did you say we finally crested? It's going down, it's on the downward slide right now. So we did flood a little bit this year, but did well. We were well protected with what we have up here now. So any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. Aye.